Okay, so welcome back to the Locker Room Podcast, uh, episode number 26. Um, very grateful for the guy, we, the guest we've got on today, who I've been um, pl- had a pleasure to work with him for, for many years now. So we've got Mr. Paul Hall, who's the lead PDP under 23 coach at QPR, and very recently just graduated as his pro license, uh, pro license coach. So congratulations on that, Hall, Ian. Thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. It's been a um, uh, funny, funny old year, hasn't it? It's been a strange year, but it's good that we're back in the office now and working working together. So that's nice. Yeah, yeah. I think it's one of the uh, the reason why I said that was because uh, you mentioned the pro license and the pro license just came through. So I finished it beforehand and I was supposed to go to a, um, a, a ceremony to go and get it presented to me. But it came through the post the other day. So um, I actually finished it about six months ago. But because of the lockdown, I couldn't I couldn't properly finish it and properly finish it all off. So that, uh, that stops you applying for all those big time jobs over the lockdown anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Hawley, thank you very much. I'm going to jump straight in in a minute. Just before we do, um, here's a little bit from the, about the sponsors from, from myself, Kiers and, uh, and Joe. So again, thanks to Rips uh, for sponsoring us and a little bit on them just now. This episode is sponsored by Ripped. Uh, very kindly have come on board with us with dailysportscience.com. So Ripped is a coaching platform that connects performance coaches with their clients and athletes. It helps coaches program more effectively and efficiently and deliver individualized training plans to their clients and athletes via the Ripped app, which is ripped.app, R-Y-P-T.app, where they have the supportive exercise technique videos and other content. The platform streamlines the collection of workouts, well-being and training load data so coaches have all their data in one place and can quickly get the insights they need to optimize their performance and improve, improve results for their clients and athletes. Thanks very much to, to Ripped uh, again for their support and make sure to head over to rip, ripped.app or else go to dailysportscience.com forward slash pod. Thanks guys. Okay, perfect. Hawley, um, again, thank you very much for coming on. I think for those that don't know you um, and people that probably a lot of people would have followed your career, maybe some haven't, could you basically start off with your playing career, but your club career? Maybe just give us a brief history of, of who you played for and how you got into the game and, and what you kind of went through when you was a player. Okay, well, so uh, I started off as a, a youngster who didn't really play in any kind of academy. I was just self-taught up until the age of about 16. And then the club started coming, coming in when the, the YTS you know, contract started to be dished out. And uh, I just got into Torquay United, started playing for them, then was there for two years and then got transferred. I was playing in the first team, around the first team players at 16, 17. And uh, then went to, got transferred after 100 games. I was only 19 went to Portsmouth, spent a good six years there. And then I was playing the Premier League um, in, in 1998, um, as well as playing in the World Cup for Jamaica. So I've had a club career that's uh, spanned over 22 years with a lot of football clubs. And uh, people could question my loyalty, but I just like to think that I spread the love. <laughs> well, there was too many for me to, to reel off. So I wanted you to go through them all, Hawley, but just yeah. give a flavour of, so you was at Torquay as a kid, then you went Torquay, to... Torquay, then I went to Portsmouth, then from Portsmouth to Coventry, and I did two loan spells there at Sheffield United, Bury, and another one actually West Brom. Then from there I went to Warsaw, Rushton and Diamonds, uh, to Tranmere, then to Chesterfield, from Chesterfield back to Warsaw, and then um, I finished off at Wrexham. So uh, I may have missed a couple in that, <laughs> but no. Someone will be listening and, and will spot that for sure. Um, yeah. Ollie, just a quick one, because we'll talk about the World Cup coming on in a minute. But yeah. from a playing perspective, you didn't go through the academy system. Like nowadays, that's quite rare. But back then, was it still a rarity, or did like did did you, did you feel you lacked um, like a technical understanding and knowledge of the game, or were you able to hold your own straight away? Well, it's funny because I couldn't strike a ball straight, and that's the type of things that you uh, you learn. You learn the technical side of things. Um, and that's one of the things that I couldn't do, but I got into it and I learned quickly. So with myself, the fact that I lacked being in a, an organized 
environment, when I got into an organized environment, once I've got all my creativity stuff out of the way, when I was learning on the streets and street ball, I, I kind of learned the organization very quickly. So I did it the other way around, I suppose, to what a lot of people are trying to do it now. A lot of people will get in there from an early age and then learn to be creative once they've learned the basics. I did it the other way around and I felt it, it, it helped me because I was there having to learn for myself and it, and it was really good. Well, just on that then, do you think then there's, there's times where people are overcoached and we take away that creativity and that ability to express themselves because from such an early age, we're working on key technical things and tactical things in certain clubs? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, when I was playing for Jamaica, the one thing that, w that I always used to know about was that people, or I just noticed, was that people were very good with the ball um, in in Central America area, in the South American area. Which we, these games are our local games in Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, uh, Costa Rica, um, all those countries, Paraguay, Colombia, and what you used to see was a lot of kids just playing in unorganized setups in the streets just playing learning by themselves no coaches and by the time they went into an organized setup they've already got what they're going to come in there with yeah so yeah i think um yeah we do overcoach at times and sometimes we just uh, we should just let let the game be the teacher at times for sure and where's where's the balance with that now so if you've got a, I don't know, an under 12s team that they're in four times a week is it your responsibility as that coach to then endorse the stuff outside or should you make training look a little bit messier like a playground game yeah, how do you get that in yeah lots of playground games i mean uh, i do it at 23s level i would do it at first team level because play that's where the learning takes place scruffiness it's not supposed it if it looks scruffy, then I think there's a lot of people that's trying to make sense of the scruffiness, which that's what it looks like on the, on the street. You know, it, it, it's very scruffy um, and people are having to, you know, it's, it's constrained, but in a very, very different way. Mm -hmm. So I think back in the days when, we, when I was playing football, to answer your question, yes, I do feel that it should be a lot messy and it should be just let the game be the teacher and a lot of playground games, working on heading, working on throwing, working on different things, but where the kids don't know it and it just looks like it's just unorganised chaos. Yeah, cheers, Holly. We'll get on to the coaching like, um, details a bit later on, but just on that then, so where's the balance with the actual coaching side? So things looking scruffy and getting them to make decisions and make sense of what's going on. Where does the coach then step in from a coaching perspective and then say, well, actually, from a technical perspective, X, Y and Z? Well, the, 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 technical, the technical side, I think you can work on a technical thing. So because it's scruffy, you're going to get a lot of realism. This is how the game looks. The game looks scruffy. And I think it's actually closer to the game than we actually think. So I think you coach the end things or coach whatever it is you're trying to coach. So if you're working on shooting or volleying, then you can actually coach the timing of volleying and coach the timing of whatever it is that you're trying to coach when you chuck a ball in and it, it's messy, sometimes it's, it's shooting on the spin, yeah. but you know, you, you can, you can control it in isolation, but then you can look at it, what it looks like in a, in a, in a chaos game, in a playground game. So I think the skill of the coach, it's down to the skill of the coach really. And knowing when to step in, you've got to take that back to the lab. So the shooting you take back to the lab, yeah. the throwing you take back, the heading you take back, but then you look at, look, what it looks like in a training session or it looks like in a playground game, that's when you, uh, you can actually coach it because that's the end product of what you want to see. For sure. I'm sure we'll come on to a bit more, uh, a little bit later around that, Hawley. You mentioned uh, the World Cup, obviously a, a massive achievement for yourself and your family and, and the nation as well. You was a um, huge part in getting to the finals in 1998. Talk to us a little bit. You spoke to about Central America there. Talk to us a little bit about the qualifiers. Like, how hard was it to get there and maybe go into a few games that were kind of critical in, in you guys getting across the line to the World Cup? Okay, so um, when this is quite funny, really, because when we were uh, myself, Fitzroy Simpson, and Dion Burton, who were all playing for Portsmouth at the same time, we realized that we're probably not going to play for England. And we said, you know, who else could we play for? Who else would take us? And then uh, we went to, uh, we realised that we were all Jamaican descendants and we realised that Jamaica were doing really poorly in their World Cup qualifiers. So we wrote away and the, the Brazilian manager at the time was René Simois and 
he didn't really like English players because he thought that they were very stiff and very, you know, back to front and, and the Brazilians like to play the beautiful game. And we wrote to them and said, can we come for a trial? So we said, yeah, he goes, but you've got to pay for your own, you've got to pay for your own fare. So we paid for our own fare, got over there. After day one, they said, yeah, we'll take you. They were bottom of the league. And then we played a few games, which were Canada, Costa Rica and El Salvador. And we got nine points. And so we were top of the group at that stage. So going away to El Salvador was really, really tough. I mean, that was, these guys are really good. They're, they play in triangles. They zigzag through the pitch. Everybody's comfortable with the ball, even the goalkeeper. And it's hot and it's really trying. It's, it's so unlike England. You, it, you know, you have to adapt really quickly. Yeah, yeah. But um, it, was, it was really good because we were just learning a new style of football. And again, these places, you went away to these places, they're really daunting places to go. But it was about having the resilience to get through it and, and, um, and, and stick together as a team and, and really believe in yourself. And we brought what we was bringing to the World Cup qualifiers and we found ourselves going to France, which was fantastic. For sure. And we'll get on to that in a little bit, Hawley. Um, you said, obviously, you had a few good players f- from England. You didn't say good, but you definitely were some good players going over, over there to play for them. Was there a togetherness in the group that yeah. like, you had that really got you across the line? And that it seemed that way, the reggae boys, the party boys. Was there yeah. that togetherness behind the scenes? The togetherness was what got us through. I mean, listen, with football, everybody's doing the same thing t- t- technically and tactically. Everybody's doing the same thing physically. But when you get into that psychological corner, yeah. It is. It becomes about how motivated you are, how you know your decision making when the going gets tough. What's the togetherness like? I mean, this guy was a a professor in um, philosophy, and he used that philosophy to ask us questions and put put things on us. And you know, I was with some people who were not the most honest people in the world. Let's put it that way. And he managed to get a group of people together to go and qualify and to show you how difficult it was, they haven't qualified since. So that's in excess of 20, 22 years ago now. So it, that goes to show you that it's not the easiest thing in the world to qualify from the CONCACAF group because you've got such big teams in there, but the togetherness was the key why we, why we were able to do that. And you spoke about the manager there. Was it, was it the manager getting you across the line or was it the, the players come together at times or the whole group? How, how was the dynamic there? Well, I think when you've got a good group of, of players, it's about how you facilitate it. You've got to facilitate it as the leader. Yeah. Um, and he did that. He managed to, you know, little things like he didn't want all the English players to, to room in the English, in the English together with the hotels. You had to mix with your team you had to, when you're coming down, if one person was late, then the whole squad was late. We were, we were all in it together. And he'd, he'd make us go and do speeches. Um, and it's, we were going out for dinner. We'd, we'd all have, always have to do a speech. And it could be you. And he'd always keep you on edge. And it was just something that we all realised that we was in it together. And then, obviously, when you're pointing towards going to France, it's something that all of us never had. And we all wanted it. And he just facilitated us in, in, in achieving that. We would all do little quizzes and we'd always find things to do with our time that were always together. And is it something that you've learned off him? Stuff that you've learned off him now that you, now you're in you know, high coaching roles, you're, you're putting that into place? 100%. I mean, what I tend to do is I'm always about, I'm about the, uh, the connection with people. And he was all about the connection. I took that from him. And I've always tried to make a, a good connection with people because um, I really do believe it's part of what motivates people is, is you know, and helps people to, to feel safe in an environment. And if you can help them feel a certain type of relatedness and, and care for them, then they realise that you've got their best interests at heart and they'll run through a brick wall for you. And we ran through a brick wall for our coach and he single-handedly did that and he created the environment for us to do that so yeah I've got that I've taken that massively and I always try and instill it by letting everybody feel respected and, and, um, and appreciated 
amazing stuff, Holly. So fast forward then to to the, the World Cup finals itself. Must have been a, a fantastic experience. Three mm. games against three tough opposition. You can talk a little bit more about the details in a minute. How did how did you find that? Did you feel like as a nation you was out of your depth in the terms that you you'd never been there before, or as a player you was on a stage in front of I don't know however many thousand people? How was your feeling? How was the team feeling going into those games? Um, the, the team feeling was confident because we knew that we were in a, the group of um, life for Argentina and Croatia, um, but the group of death for um, Jamaica and Japan. And that's what it was. You know, we were in a tough group. We'd gone around, but we, we, what we were doing was we'd probably burnt ourselves, burnt ourselves out. We played a lot of games in our run-up to the World Cups, which was probably a little bit of an anticlimax, if I'm honest, because we were expecting so much more from ourselves, even though we were in a tough group. Um, we played Brazil that year and didn't get beat. In the, you know, we played them and, and played them off the park. We, we, we'd climbed up. We were the highest climbing team in FIFA at one point. And it was just, it was just real. It was, it was surreal to be there. And it was surreal to know that you're going there. But then obviously when you're playing in, you know, I'm playing for Portsmouth and you're playing in games, you're just hoping that you don't get tackled, which is going to spoil your World Cup plan. Yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, yeah, a lot of emotions and a lot of things that go through your mind and go through your career in just wanting to be on that plane to get there. And was you disappointed as a team with the outcome? Like, did you, did you have aspirations and realistic ambitions to get through the group? Yeah, because the coach used to say to us, look, I've booked it. I've booked our hotel through to the final. And he had to say that because there's no point booking it for the first three games because then you're only expecting, you haven't booked, you know, you haven't expected it. But after the first game, we'd lost our first game. And then the second game, we lost that one. It was pretty apparent that we were going on early. So it was disappointing. But, you know, some teams have been to World Cups two and three times and never won a game. Yeah. And we went there and we beat Japan, which was which was a massive key for us. And we just wished that we'd had those games in the in the opposite way around. Like yeah. play Japan first, and then you've got yourself a chance in the second game. And nick, the a po- game. nick a point, and you never know. Yeah, that. yeah. Best, best. Well, or you can name a few, but best player you played against in in that experience. Oh, um, Romario. Yeah. Um, he was playing for Brazil earlier that year in in the January, I think it was. Uh, he was superb. Mario, Edmundo, there were some good players in that team. De Nilsson. Uh, but we were playing against, I mean, when you go and play international football, you forget that you're playing against these, the, you're playing against some world stars, yeah. world class players. Um, against Argentina, there was Batistuta, Ortega, uh, Diego Simeone, you know, uh, Veron. The, all these players were playing for their teams. You play against Croatia, you had Prozinecki, Davos Suko, and you just realise that you're actually on the big stage and there's no time. I mean, Alan Ball was my manager who won the World Cup in 1966 and he sent me away to, and I felt that was a a massive coup for me. And he just said, enjoy it, son. He goes, don't let it pass you by because it'll come and go quicker than you think. And I was like, "Ah, wow. And I didn't know what he was talking about at the time. I was like, "Ah, what's he talking about? And then that's the advice I'd give to anybody who's going to a World Cup. Fantastic. Anything you learned that you can look back on now? Obviously, you must have learned loads as a player, but anything you learned from a coaching perspective and an environment in, in that high pressure situation that you can, you can bring to today? Yeah, high pressure. It's, it, it's about, my coach always used to say to me, um, empty the stadium in your minds. Empty the stadium in your minds, because some people used to have trouble with uh, turning up and playing in front of, I mean, we played in front of 120,000. 100,000, 90,000, you know, and, and these teams, they, I mean, Mexico, they don't mess about, you know, they're getting after you from the word go. Yeah. And in that Azteca Stadium, they're really getting after you. And you just got to empty the stadium. It's just a football match. So I always t- try to tell my players that a match is just an extension of training. Um, and there's lots of different things that I've learned from a playing and a coaching point of view that I always try and instill into my players. Um, that it's just an extension of training and the, the actual match is the test. And I rub that from, from um, I take that from, from, from rugby where they play and they're, they're actual top 
when they play the, the All Blacks, their top is the test. So they, they, they train and now that top is the test to, to test their learning, test their physical ability. When they're wearing black, this is the actual test that you're going through. So yeah, there's some good stuff. That's a good point. And I think it gives a bit of focus into the training week, doesn't it? In terms of what you're working on and, and what you want to see as a coach from your players in the game. Um, perfect. Okay, let's fast forward a little bit, Hawley. Just talk a little bit about your coaching coaching side of things. But just before we do that, just going to hear from a couple of us about a few initiatives we've got going on at, at the SS. The Locker Room Podcast is brought to you by DailySportsScience.com, an online elite coaching and sports science service, membership service. Uh, you can search all the information and services over at DailySportsScience.com. You see everything over there. I'm here with Ross and Joe. Lads, there's loads of stuff going on at the moment. Ross, you, we'll run through really quick. Ross, you've got a really interesting off-season coaches CPD series, video series for the members. Yeah, yeah, really good kid. So six part um, uh, presentation, six part presentation, six different topics that uh, are kind of out there on social media and stuff. And I'm kind of, let's say, doing three to four of them and, and you guys are taking the baton on that. So really good so far. We've had two released based on the individual training session and periodization. Uh, recorded one recently around developing the individual player. We've got one around the physical corner and then you guys are taking over the tactical side and also the environment and culture. So really good um, opportunity, especially with things going on in Ireland at the minute to learn and, and keep sharing information. So really enjoyed that, really good feedback um, and they'll be released throughout the next six weeks. Great stuff, Joe. There's loads of Gaelic football and hurling practices going up as well. Yeah, there is, Kieran. Uh, every, every week there's, uh, there are Gaelic uh, practices going up. <clears throat> and I know that Ross talked about, um, I think I'm doing CPD session four, which is how to set up a team tactically. So um, uh, I'm putting up uh, some kickouts there, for instance, and some uh, defensive structures that coaches can kind of get, get used to in the off season and plan, plan to bring in maybe, maybe next season. So yeah, lots of stuff there uh, coming up on the website in terms of practices. Good stuff. We've got an off season a GA program as well in terms of gym program and fitness and running program as well uh, designed by Ben Smalley our sports scientist as well um, and overlooked by Ross as well head of performance so that's really good for all members so they're all exclusive members the last two things to mention then is the locker room webinar series which is closed for exclusive for our DSS members so that's every second Monday night we bring on an expert to do a presentation a PowerPoint presentation through Zoom everyone can dial in live and then ask some questions as well it's been really popular and it's, it's a brilliant new initiative we're always coming up with these new initiatives the last thing then to mention is the buddy referral scheme so that's where a member can uh, send it send a referral to their friend the friend will get 25% off the sign up fee and then the person, the member will get access to one of the GA positional profile videos. So Ross, we did them over the last few weeks. I think there's some good content there. Class content. I think it's a great initiative instead of just, you know, normally the person who refers someone doesn't get anything and the, the new member gets whatever the offer is. But this stuff is gold dust, in my opinion. You know, you get info on what uh, each position essential is and what you're looking for for each player and how to coach it. So it gives you real good information on, on developing the individual players in your team. Uh, enjoy the rest of the episode, everybody. The podcast, remember, dailysportscience.com and head over. Um, we've actually started a new offer for listeners to the podcast so just use pod 20 as a voucher code to sign up membership and you get 20 percent off as well so for any new members out there or relapsed members just use pod 20 and you get 20 percent off membership a good time as the lads say ross was saying with all the new cpd and everything so a good time to join up okay enjoy Perfect. Okay, fast forward to the present day. Hawley, you are you're now the lead under twenty three coach QPR. You've been doing that now for I think four years. Four five. five been, it's my fifth five. year now. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I undercooked first. He'd been here forever, so I, I'd undercooked yeah. you as well. Um, <laughs> did, did you always think you'd go into coaching? Like as a player, did you think, well, when I retire, I know I'm going to go that way, or was you not too sure the path you was going to take? Well, I, I've had a career pretty much like everybody else who's a YTS or a youth trainee, which is you go and do your badges early. You don't ever feel that you're going to need them. But I always had an interest in how the game was played and how the game was coached. 
Um, I didn't think that I was going to be a coach, but then I didn't know what else I was going to do. So at the end of football, I started taking my badges. But the really, when it, it wasn't until I met Rene Simois, who was my Jamaica first team coach, the ex-Brazilian national team coach, and he gave me the gave me an interest into wow, you can really take a group of people and you can really make life special for them, you know, on and off the pitch, and that really interested me. So I started doing my badges and I started taking the, the examples from what he gave me about movement and about, you know, how you train. And he, it was so different from England. It was crazy. It was like, I just started to learn how to play football. And I wanted to learn how to coach football, like how he could coach us to play. So you know, I started to become a student of the game and started to be, to, to start thinking about how do other people do it and started thinking about, you know, Cruyff and Pep and, and, and all those different people and I've just become a, a student of it. So that's how I didn't think I was going to become a coach, but once I ca- once I came into it, I kind of love it almost as much as I love playing. Yeah. And how how hard was that then going from being coached in that way to then being coached to I presume a completely different way when you went back to your club? It was it was tough to go back. Because what you were doing, you were playing with world-class players one week and then going back and playing with, um, and playing with I wouldn't say, uh, and playing with non-world-class players. Mm-hmm. So it was difficult because a world-class player sees everything that you do and you have to work hard and you're punished, punished more ruthlessly. But... And, and a world class player will see something that a, a player who's not world class won't see. Yeah. So you enjoy playing. You know, it's like going from League Two to to the Championship, yeah, yeah. or from Championship to the Premier League. You know, you, you've got so many different things that you can that you can benefit from. You know, so uh, yeah. Um, you're currently managing the under twenty three group, as you say, you've done it for five years. Yeah. How difficult is that age group? Like talk in terms of so if people that don't know oversee it's seen now as kind of the reserves, but it's mm-hmm. still the top end of the academy. So it's the transition period is huge, isn't it? How difficult do you find that managing th- those group of players at, at that sort of age group? I think I, I feel I've, I've people have said to me it's the most difficult job in the whole club. Um, I would tend to lean to agree with that because you're dealing with so many people's emotions. I mean, sometimes the first team manager will give you a player that he's not happy with and that player will come with emotions. Mm-hmm. And then you'll get some 18 players who will put themselves into the our group and feel that they should be first team players and should be in your group all the time. You'll get the 23s players who want to be out on loan and don't want to be with you or be with the first team. So you're constantly dealing with people's emotions. Um, and that's the toughest part of the job. Because you have to focus them and, and try and keep a, an environment of learning, an environment of uh, wanting to, the players wanting to, to work. And sometimes when a player doesn't want to be in your group or with you, then it's, it's difficult to keep them motivated. So, yeah, it is one of the toughest jobs um, that I've seen in football, but it's such a great job for preparing you. Uh, because, like I said, there's no better job than a tough job to prepare you for what's to come in the future. Sure. So how, how do you go about, well, someone that isn't motivated to be in your group and train with you, how do you go about motivating them? It comes down to the care thing again. You know, I think um, I just feel that once that player realises that you've got their best interests at heart, yeah. so you've got to almost sell it to them, and, and challenge them really and use their experience. So for example, if it's a first team player and he's come across to the, the, the 23s and he doesn't want to be there, I've got to put it on him that he's got such a responsibility because everybody's looking up to that player. Now you, you, you're, you're, you're perfectly entitled to be um, upset, but you still got to do the work. Um, and I don't want to have to, exclude you from the group I want to use you as a shining example to the group and then um, once a senior player like that's taking it seriously then the others just will plainly follow because they want to be like that player 
On the other hand, if that player, if you don't get hold of that player quickly enough, it can be, you know, a bad apple can spoil the rest of the apples. So uh, it's, it's really important to make sure that you address that person, but have their best interests at heart. Probably make a point of working on them, make the session about them as well as everybody else and give them responsibility that, that, that everybody else should be looking up to. Sure, I'm sure you've had some examples without naming names of, of both ends. Finding of examples. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to steal your phrase here, Hawley. So about the under-23 group, obviously it's the link now to first-team football, and as you call it, mortgage football, uh, where they're going to have to provide and, and put food on the table for their job. How do you prepare them for that? How does it differ from the academy football where things are perceived as nice and technical and development? How do you, prefer, how do you prepare them for that? Well, you, you know, you've got to you've got to work with them, especially with the ones that are going out on loan. Mm. You've got to prepare them to be adaptable. So right across the, um, right across the board, they've got to be able to be able to play for Neil Warnock and they've got to be able to play for Pep Guardiola. So you've got to teach them the whole array of football. So they've got to know about heading. They've got to know about clearances. They've got to know about um, second balls. They've got to know about scruffy football like, Again, you have to maybe loan players out to a team that doesn't play attractive football like ourselves for them to get that, that experience. Um, so the loan market is key for them. And then obviously in our games programme, we try to play a couple of games a week if we can to, to get the workload into them so that there's no recovery and then they play again. Um, and like I say, play some teams who are like, I don't know, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, like a non-league team who are going to beat them up a little bit. And when they play there, they can be exposed to not just football that's on the grass all the time, but football where it's against people who are paying their mortgage, who will slide tackle you and the ball out of play and, and you're going over the, the billboards, that type of thing. And it's, it's refreshing for them. I mean, it, it, it is a surprise to them and a shock to their system. But for the majority of the lads, that, this is where they will end up. So we have to prepare them with the skills that go right across the board. So they have to be super adaptable. Sure. And then you've spoken a lot about how you care and get relatedness to your players and, and mm. a connection. But do you sometimes have to treat them a little bit the other way because they're going to have to be under managers who probably won't put an arm around them? Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that is part of the care package that, that I provide. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not... I mean, care doesn't mean being nice all the time. Sometimes yeah. care is being cruel to be kind. I have to be um, autocratic a lot of the time to, to get the message across to these players and, and really give them a good telling off yeah. because sometimes they may, they may not be psychologically switched on. You know, there's thousands of reasons and, and sometimes I'll just do it so that, you know, sometimes we'll have a lead two day where it's just the ball's not allowed to hit the ground. They've got to serve it in at different angles. It just prepares them, make them adaptable. Like you say, it's not just sometimes care is by giving them a really good going over and, and making them run or making them, I don't know, play a scruffy game of football and really giving, giving it them if they're, if they're not at the races because people's lives depend on this game of football and it can't be nicey-nicey all the time. For sure, for sure. Um, just moving on a little bit to the, the, the MDT, Hawley. So obviously you you fortunate or unfortunate enough to work with, within an MDT. Um, I'm the fortunate one, mate. My, myself <laughs> included many years ago. Um, how do you manage your MDT as, as a leader of that age group? And I firmly believe, you know, the, the lead coach should be the leader of that MTT. How do you manage them? And what sort of things are you looking for from the staff that are working with you to support these players? Well, their expertise, really. I mean, it's, it's important that everybody around the table gets a voice for me. Everybody around that table needs to be able to be strong enough or feel empowered enough to be able to say, I think this, or I think that, or I think it would be good if we did this. And sometimes we'll get into arguments and sometimes we'll get into heated discussions about the best way forward. The most important thing is, you know, I've got to use everybody else's expertise. I'm the football expert. You're the SNC expert, you know, the physical, we've got um, psychologists, nutritionists, 
we've got um, performance analysis, uh, you know, we've got physios, and every one of those guys will add something into the middle of the table or the middle of the pie so that we can get the best service from my team for the players. And that's how I see it. And sometimes, even though I'm leading it, I may not be the best person for that particular job. So it's me as a leader, my my expertise in leadership to be able to pick that person who's the best person for the job and allow them to lead. You know, and, I, and, I, and I'm a massive believer in everybody having uh, a great say and everybody having an equal footing in the in the um especially in the mdt meetings yeah no a good answer and i think it's important to say that it's okay to disagree isn't it like professionally disagree with people um, i actually like it yeah I, I actually sometimes i'll actually throw a little grenade i'll bite the, the pin off it and i'll just throw it into the middle of the table just to get some challenge and some difference and to see where we're all thinking because like i said once we walk out the door we may not be all in agreement, but we were all in agreement to work together yeah. for what the decision that's been made. And sometimes, a lot of the times, we will agree because we're all like-minded people. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we're always going to see eye to eye. And I may, I may have to back down a little bit from what I thought because, you know, it, the same thing happened this morning. It, the same kind of challenge happened this morning. So I like that where there's challenge in the group. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you're breaking unity. You're still united. But it's, I think I think a lot of people back away from that, especially maybe young, younger practitioners in, in different disciplines, you know, but it's a part of the game that helps to improve you as an individual as well. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about coaching detail, Hawley. So yeah. what does obviously in the week, it will depend on what day you're in, where the game is, your periodization, whatever that is. But what does for the listeners, a typical training session look like? And you can talk about differences that might get added in, but what the, what does a typical training session that you would take look like for those to come and see it? Is this once we're, we're, we're once we're outside? Yeah. Outside on the grass. Okay. So we're out on the grass and there's um, obviously whichever, SNC is working with us. There'll be a, a little warm up of some sort just to get the lads um, switched on and just to get the lads, their legs moving um, and really to just switch them on. And then they'll go into a thing called um, TC, which is total control, which is ball juggling. It's ball juggling and passing the ball. And the lads have to buy themselves into the session with 225 passes. So it's like if you're a pian pianist, you'll go and you'll be doing your scales early. And then you'll be just getting yourself ready for passing the ball because that's what we do. And they'll be passing this. They'll be utilising their, their passes from 75s, we call them. A pass from right foot to right foot. And they'll be working on different types of passes that they're going to need in the training session. And ball juggling. So they familiarise themselves with the ball. And then um, we'll go into some sort of passing drill uh, where depending on whatever I want in later on in the session, I'll be warming them up. So I tend to work, when I'm planning the session, I tend to work backwards. So I see what outcome I want. And then, I, then the, so say if there's four exercises, I'll start with exercise four and then I'll work myself back to see what kind of things that I need in, in, um, in sessions, one, in activities one, two and three. Yeah. And so it'll be some kind of passing activity and then we'll work them up into a possession activity um, just depending on what we're working on but eat with each one of my sessions there has to be attacking defending transitions in there and a few set pieces so they're the five moments that I work on and everything in, in everything I do has to have those five things in there so attack defense because that's what they're going to do so there's no point in me doing anything else I'm going to yeah. I'm going to set them for it sometimes they don't know that they're doing it yeah but it just happens organically um, and then we'll go into some small-sided games at the end. So possession, and then it goes into a small-sided game. But they'll always be related to each other. Yeah. <laughs> and then, obviously, there's going to be some players who, because it's an individual strength-based program, they'll be going into little silos where they're working on improving their individual games um, by setting up little practices. And you'll always see at the end of the sessions, players going and doing finishing or going and doing passing or going and do working on their defending and so that's how it looks perfect well you mentioned there's a good point actually linked on to the individual side so obviously aside from the little individual unit work and, and extra stuff you do after how do you make sure 
while you spoke a bit about attacking defending transitions, which probably covers a lot of individual programs or essential job roles anyway, but how do you make sure that players get their individual programs and know they're working on their individual programs? Because sometimes they probably aren't aware of it or does it matter? Um, well, there's a lot of things that happen just organically and the players in their individual programs that we speak about every six weeks will say, okay, I want you to try and see if you can focus on this. It will always come up. It will always come up because when attacking, defending, transition happen, it will always come up something that they need to work on because that's just the very nature of the game. Um, it's the skill of um, the, the games that I provide. I have to make sure that they're getting what they need to get. So if somebody's working on heading, if I haven't done a practice that's working on heading, then I've let that player down. So I have to put, I mean, and sometimes when at the end of it, I always leave it open for the players to say, if I haven't uh, covered what you needed to cover, come to me at the end of the training and we'll do it. We'll do it as a small silo. So the, the players are in charge of their own development there, especially at 23s. I've got to put on an ex, I've got to put on loads of activities that cover their individual learning needs. Yep. And just going there about the, taking responsibility of their development, the total control for you guys, the players lead that, don't they? At the yeah. start. Yeah. So the, the coach doesn't, they know what they got to do and they, and they, like yeah. you say, buy themselves into the session. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I believe that, you know, across the continuum, I believe that nine year olds can do it. You know, yeah. I, uh, what I do believe is they can do it, but they, they, they probably need a little bit of, um, of adjustments. So if they're not doing it correctly, then you can go in and adjust and say, look, this is how you do it. But I think sometimes we don't give the players the, the respect of, actually, they've done this a thousand times before. Yeah. Let's see who the leaders are. There's so many opportunities that we don't give them. And that's why I leave them, because I know that I could be setting something up somewhere else because they know, and I'll just say to them, coach each other, because the best coaches that we're, that's ever going to be is is their peers yeah you know they listen to their peers more than anybody else and they're the best coaches they can get in a in a one statement what we have to get in a in a, in a phase yeah so i always tend to put it on them and leave it to them a, a lot and just adjust them if they're not doing it correctly yeah so you spoke about adjusting a nine-year-old it might be about technical some technicality or some technical detail yeah. but with the 23s how often do you have to step in and adjust them in terms of mindset especially if they've done it thousands of times, do, yeah. do you see certain individuals just going through the motions and stuff? Yeah, it's about the, them going through the motions that more, like you say, with some people, because the pyramid doesn't necessarily mean, because you're at the top of the pyramid in, in terms of age, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're at the top of the pyramid in terms of technical ability. Yeah. So it, it's such a mixed group that I might have to, the 19-year-old or the 23-year-old, I might have to adjust what they're doing technically I've got a lot of players who come in off trial who can't do the t who can't do the the, the, t the uh, total control because they're just not familiar with it. So it's important that um, I I just look at the group and sometimes it's uh, it's mainly about mindset, like you quite rightly said. Mm -hmm. I have to focus them and say, "Come on, that's not good enough. Go and do it again." You know, we're here to work now. Yeah. But more often than than not, I have to go in and probably somebody who's in the middle of the pyramid who isn't at the level of, of, of others, I have to maybe um, teach them how to, how to chest the ball back properly or how to keep the ball up because it, you can't assume, you can't assume that they all know it. No, that's a very good point about age and pyramid and, and mm. assuming that their technical level is at the high level at the top of the pyramid. Mm. Um, I know you're big on certain principles of your play and the way you like to play Hawley. Um, could you maybe give an insight to a few of the principles that you really want from your players and your teams and how do you then go about achieving those? Okay, so, um, I mean, effort and desire and, and, and enthusiasm is, is, a, is just, a, it goes without saying, I can't even call it a, a principle because it is something that is a prerequisite, so mm -hmm. to speak. I think from an attacking point of view, we always want our team to play expansively, work with triangles and diamonds um, and, and try to get the ball wide or, you know, over, round or through. I'm, I'm a massive believer in over, round or through. Three ways of getting round the opposition, I feel. It's clear there's only three points that's there. 
so the players are clearing what they have to do over round or through they'll have a go over over the press they'll go around the side a bit or they can go through the press they've got a choice um from a defending point of view nearest man straight to the ball you know we try and swarm it it's kind of like a total control approach the dutch way so nearest man goes straight to the ball everybody else leaves the furthest man that's one principle um and we try and swarm the ball um Set play principle would be hand on and play quickly. Um, and so it wouldn't be, you know, there because what we want to do is not give the opposition any time to think. We want to circulate the ball very, very quickly, move the ball, try and knock on a few doors and probe. So hand on and play is a principle of set plays. Um, transition, um, a principle of, of transition is to, um, you know, again, you lose the ball whether you're losing the ball or you're gaining the ball back quickly. If you're out of possession to in possession on a transition, you're just trying to get forward as quickly as possible and try and counter attack quickly. And then the other way around, you're trying to get back behind the ball and create a, a, a brick wall for the, for, the, for the team or delay for the team to, um, to get back and recover. So there's a, a few of the principles. I mean, there's many, many principles yeah, we should sure. go into, but um yeah, there's, there's, there's loads of principles, but yeah, circulation of the ball is a main principle. Pass it quickly. And would these principles still be the same if you changed job, for example, when you went to a first team? Or do you think those principles are adaptable to who you have? Um, no, because I believe that there's, I, I believe that they're, they're very easy principles because what you have to do is you've just got to be quite superior with the ball. If you're superior with the ball and you're passing and receiving, then there's always a place for you in an environment like that. You know, it's quite easy to be able to say, look, I want people to form triangles because it's about team cohesion. Yeah. And it's about um, understanding the principles. I think if you're principle based, you've got a chance. Yeah. So yes, I would keep it the same. I would, uh, I would make sure that you, you work off principles. So it doesn't matter what shape you play. Your principles are always going to remain the same. You go straight to the ball. You may be playing against teams who are better than you, but I then believe you've got to be better at what you're better at because it's what I know. So there's no sure. point in me changing and saying, right, I've got to go and do something I don't know. I've always been this way. Yeah. I've got to have a healthy respect for everything, but I've just got to be at the top of the game, the top of the tree in what I do. For sure. And you mentioned a few things there, Holly, that leads into your philosophy. And we've had Chris on, on the show previously who outlined the, let's say, the academy philosophy. What's anything that's different to you individually as your philosophy? And it could be on the grass, could be off the grass that, that makes your coaching or gives you a difference, I guess, a different approach to someone else. Is there anything you firmly believe in within your philosophy? Um. Yeah, I mean, I like, I like, if I'm being honest with you, I like, to, I like it to have an identity. I like to, if we had just white tops on or just plain tops on, you could tell a Paul Hall team. Mm. I, I like the fact of, I, I do like the way how QPR play football. We, we're flowing, we're fast, we get it. You know, I like to play with wingers. I like to, my wingers to get hold of the ball and really be exciting. I like my tens to get in between the lines and play forward quickly. Um, I like my defenders to be able to cope 1v1. I like my goalkeeper coming high up the pitch and challenging the other team to, to, to chip them. You know, I like to be in possession of the ball. So um, I don't think it's much different. I think we could play, you, me and Chris could play 4-3-3 and we'd all play it in a totally different way. Yeah. You know, and, and the philosophy, my philosophy is just a 4-3-3 but with tweaks I like it being fluid, people moving all over the place, but being in control of all the movements. And um, you, know, you, you always want to be able to put it to the test one day. And I, I, I'm just lucky enough that I get to put it to the test every, every week. But sometimes you want to put it for t to the test for real and see what you're going to be like with, with, um, with first team players and top players. For sure, and we'll come on to the future in a little bit. I guess my four three three might have two sitters and, and the back four <laughs> defenders exactly. in the box. You never know. Um, exactly. Everyone has their own style. Um, yeah. I'm only joking for anyone that's listening out there. Holly, just moving away from the coaching a little bit and, and maybe some maybe something that's quite close to your heart or, or maybe it's not. Obviously, throughout the COVID period, we had an emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, 
originated from America and George Floyd. And this has been around for, you know, say no to racism as a kick it out. There's been loads of different campaigns in the football, um, football side of things. From your perspective, and now there's more talk about what's going to happen and, and making change, what's things been like for you as a black player and also as a black coach? Do you feel that you've, you've been limited in opportunity because of the colour of your skin personally? And where do you see things going? Is there change evident or is it just talk at the moment? Good questions, man. Um, I think, yes, I've been definitely held back as a coach because of the colour of my skin. I'm lucky enough to be, I'm one of the very lucky few to be at a football club that's diverse. I think that we're here, we're like, I always say we're like Benetton, right? We've got people from all walks of life and we all coexist and we're all so diverse in our, in our workforce. And I think that a lot of the, you know, whoever it is, Sky, um, the Premier League, the, the FA, doesn't matter who it is, they should come and have a look at our football club and have a look at our workforce and see how we do things because we're quite a successful academy. Uh, we've got many players in, so we're doing a good job. But there's black, white, there's Asian, there's every all walks of life in senior positions. And um, I really do feel that there's a lot of organisations and associations that could take a, a big chunk out of, a big example out of what we do and, and apply it to themselves. They're looking for the answer everywhere but the answer's right in front of them here in West London. Um, as, a, as a player, um, yes, I, I, I experienced racial abuse, both from people in my club, uh, players on my team, and um, the people who've managed me, uh, and op op opposing players. But in, in that walk of life, in that day and age, should I say, you, um, you're just told to get on with it, and told to... to basically to put up or shut up. And the big difference now is that you've, there's somebody there taking notice, you know, whether anything gets done about it or not, now it's getting elevated and now everything is getting, back in the 90s, back in the 80s, it, you were just told to, get, to shut up because it was just accepted. But now it's not accepted because everybody is starting to, feel like they've got a voice feel like there uh, there is somebody who's going to listen um but yeah in terms to answer your question about the the, the limited opposition of, of being a black coach 100 percent. i mean it happens every single day I, mean, I can't see myself getting you know elevated to a, a first team manager's job um without having to really be overqualified and really overperform because you know, but there are some people who don't have to do that and who can just get plucked out and it happens day in, day out. And it's just the, uh, what do you call it? The, the numbers speak for themselves. You know, there's probably four black managers out of 90 odd football clubs um, and never any more than that or hardly ever any more than that at any one time. So we make up 30% of the football, footballing family. And um, we haven't made the breakthrough of coaching yet. And it's just not good enough because we are good enough. And do you, th do you think, looking there, is, is that solely down to opportunity or is there something else that... So would a black player coming out of his career actually not want to get into coaching because of those reasons? Uh, do you think it works two ways? Yeah, it does. Because sometimes, I mean, people say, oh, there's, there's no... There, there are loads of black coaches. I know I'm a pro license coach. There's loads of black coaches who could go into Premier League and coach now. Um, but the thing is, when, when you were a kid, you probably looked up to somebody who looked like you, who was a, a footballer or a manager, who you said, one day I'm going to be like that person. There's not that many people in prominent positions for black people to say, I want to be like that person. Yeah. yeah? Because we need to, you know, if, if that's the, the way how we're looking at things, then you do need to have people in senior positions who we can say, I want to be like that person. And some people coming out of football just don't feel that it's worth, because they're never going to get anywhere. I wasn't, I didn't feel like that, but I can understand the people who do feel like that, feel that they're not going to get a job because the numbers, again, the numbers speak for themselves. We've had loads of top, top, top footballers go out of the game who haven't had a chance and that their counterparts who've had less careers than them 
um, who were white have, have gone on and, and been, give, have been afforded the chance to, to fail and have successful careers as well. No, Holly, thanks for your honesty on that. And let's, let's hope in 20, 30 years, not only are people taking notice, but we're not even talking about the situation and, mm. and, and equality is just throughout the whole, all organisations are not just, not just here in West London. Mm. Um, Holly, just going on then to a, a couple of summary questions. So thank you very much for your time. Your insight's been, been phenomenal and, and the listeners will get so much from this. You've been, in, you've been in your role and you've mentioned it a little bit about the opportunity and the future for you, but you've been in your role now for five years What's the future hold for Paul Hall? Obviously, you've, you, you're getting heavily qualified and, and, and getting ready maybe to make a move. But what, what is yourself? How do you feel yourself? Where do you see yourself going? Um, and what do you want from your career? Well, I think if I ever get to the point where I retire, I think I've done a lot in football. And if I was to quit tomorrow, I can be perfectly happy with what I've done um, in, my, in my career. But as anybody will tell you, and as you probably are yourself, you never ever want to stop at what you've done. You always want to try and go and achieve more. I'd love to be a first team manager. I'd love to be a first team manager. And just to really be afforded that chance to see if I'm good enough um, and to see if what I've learned, I can put it for real, put it to, put it to the test. I am putting what I've learned to the test now. I was a teacher um, at college and I really do believe if I didn't, do those two years at college, then I wouldn't be as good a coach as I am today. However, in the future, I see myself being in a first team and I want to be the manager of a football club, um, of one of the 92 football clubs. And uh, it is an aim of mine and it's something that I'd, I'd like to do. Um, and hence why I've done the pro license, you know. And if anything persuaded me, if I didn't think that I wanted to do it before the pro license. After the pro license, I definitely wanted to do it because like I said, I was working with and studying alongside some really good um, people who are now in the game, managing and coaching and some guest speakers on there that told me that I could do it and I've got the skills to be able to do it. So yeah, that's the future for me. Sure. Do you think the, the, the years in the academy will stand you in good stead going into a first team role? So we alluded, you alluded to it earlier, the, the, the difficulty of the job in the 23s. I yeah. think that it provides a different type of pressure in the first team. And you, you are really a few games away from losing your job at any stage with the first team. However, I really do believe that I've been given the, a great opportunity to, to head up the 23s here. And um, it's, it's prepared me. That I, for, for everything yeah. that I'm ever going to experience in, in, the, in the life of the first team. Um, I've had a double at first team before and I was quite successful at it, but it was only six months. And um, yeah, I'd love to do it again. I'd love to do it again. Fantastic. Hawley, just to, uh, just to finish off then, uh, we've got a lot of coaches on listening to this podcast, whether it be Gaelic football, rugby, football, soccer, whatever, whatever you, you term it. What's some um, long lasting advice? Could be two or three things. Could be one thing that you'd give to, to coaches listening to this podcast to finish off on? Right, long lasting advice. I think um, you've got to be adaptable, right? I think because that's, the, that's number one. I think before you're anything else, you have to be adaptable. Because if, again, I'll give you the, the, the Neil Warnock um, principle, I suppose, um, or example. If Neil Warnock asked me to come and work for him tomorrow, I've got to be able to deliver the football that he wants to see. Now, that's not tippy-tappy football. And I'm probably one of the most tippy-tappy coaches that there is. Um, but if Pep wanted me to coach, go and coach tippy-tappy football, then I'd go and be able to go and do that. So you have to be... And then you've got the coaches, that, the, the managers in the middle who don't want tippy-tappy, but they don't want long ball football. So I would say to be adaptable to everything, continue to professionally develop yourself and um and like i said be adaptable because the call could come and when the call comes you've got to be able to say right yes i'm qualified and yes i'm up to the job um another thing would be to like i said continue to professionally develop yourself um you've got to know your ologies so all your ologies you've got to know you've got to be able to have a conversation with the 
the physical guys, with the psychologists, with the uh, performance analysis guys, and um, the technical guys. You've got to know your ologies. You've got to know everything so that you can have a conversation and make detailed. Um, you can't just rely on the S&C guy telling you something. You've got to be able to know what he's talking about or she's yeah. talking about um, and know what the psychologist is talking about and be able to make a decision based on what they've said to you. But if you are in knowledge of it, then you are just uh, arming yourself for uh, to, to at least have a conversation and have a seat at the table. Otherwise, you've got to be quiet because that's not your field of expertise. I'm not saying that you've got to be the expert in it, but you've got to be able to be have an idea of what they're saying to you so that you can that you can at least challenge what they're saying. Sure. I think that's how things link properly, isn't it? Otherwise you just work in, work in isolation, right? Just in different departments. Yeah. Paulie, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I know you're prepping for a game tomorrow, so thank you for your time. Um, and I know your phone's getting badgered for, for different meetings, so I appreciate <laughs> it. The, uh, the, the listeners are going to get so much, so thank, thank you. you very much for your time. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Really